It uh, is my privilege to introduce the moderator of this afternoon's uh, panel. Uh, Rob Othier is the Chief Executive Officer of the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. Most of you in the room do know Rob. He needs no introduction, but he is a native of Holyoke, Mass. He has over 40 years of association management experience, 34 of uh, years of which have been with the Realtors Association. In 2008, he was awarded the prestigious William uh, Magel? Yes. Okay, Award for Excellence, which is the National Association of Realtors' highest honor for an association executive as association's chief staff executive. Rob is responsible for planning and overseeing the effective implementation of all association activities and services, uh, working with uh, Mars volunteer leadership and executive staff, a communications graduate of Boston University and past chairman of Mars, Mars uh, Association Executives Committee. He has served on Nars extended leadership team Executive Committee, Board of Directors, uh, Finance, Strategic Planning, and various other committees. There isn't anything this guy doesn't do. He is also uh, very instrumental in uh, uh, making sure that today's uh, program was structured properly and is a success. And again, it is uh, with great pleasure and honor that I give you Rob Roth here. As I shook his hand, I almost pulled him off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, thank you again on behalf of everybody for being here today. You are all invited guests um, as leaders of your respective uh, either association or, or entity, and, and so thank you in that regard. We obviously wanted to choose the, um, the best and brightest and all that to be here in this kind of a symposium environment. It's a little different than just a series of speeches as a symposium. The questions that you, you've asked so far have been really terrific, and we hope that continues with this amazing panel that we have here with us today. This topic is that we are now on the subject of, of, of home ownership, the future of home ownership in Massachusetts, and with this panel is, um, as a sustained, and I will add the word sustained, political priority. Obviously, right now, uh, housing and the economy are, are amazingly important um, to the economy. To be able to sustain that in the future is what's most important. So home ownership is a sustained political priority in Massachusetts and in Washington, D.C., we have three very distinguished uh, panelists with us today. The panel will speak about the priority that housing represents for our political leadership in Washington and here in Massachusetts. They will be asked to speculate on what policies will be forthcoming from the administration in Washington and here in Massachusetts and what impact those initiatives will have on, our, on home ownership, mortgage lending, and real estate sales. Greg Bialecki, Secretary for Housing and Economic Development in the middle, middle uh, chair uh, of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Secretary uh, Bialecki oversees the Commonwealth's business development, housing and communi community development, and consumer affairs and business regulation agencies. As the Governor's Chief Economic Development and Housing Advisor and Cabinet Member, Secretary Bialecki is responsible for helping achieve the Governor's top priorities, including strengthening and accelerating our economic recovery by supporting job creation in every region of the state. Throughout the governor's second term, Secretary Bialecki's agenda will focus on supporting and expanding the Commonwealth's nation-leading innovation economy, helping small businesses grow by improving their access to capital and advice and by addressing their rising health care costs and providing the housing opportunities that help build thriving, sustainable communities before joining the Patrick, administ uh, Patrick Murray administration, Secretary Bialecki enjoyed a 20-year career as a real estate development and environmental lawyer at the law firms of Hill and Barlow and DLA Par Piper Rudnick, where his uh, work focused on uh, the major urban uh, development project projects in the greater Boston area. And I want to just add personally that I very much appreciate, uh, Mr. Secretary, your uh, continued um, out reach and accessibility to the housing industry, all the people in this room, um, to come to some real solutions, um, sustainable solutions in housing. So thank you very much for being here and for all of that. Paul Bishop, Dr. Paul Bishop, Senior uh, Vice President of the National Association of Realtors, sitting in this chair here. Paul is the Vice President for Research at the National Association of Realtors. Dr. Bishop leads the research division's uh, survey and research activity, including analysis of real estate business and policy issues. Dr. Bishop participates in the Harvard Industrial Economist Roundtable and has served on the editorial board of the Journal of Housing Research prior to joining NAR in 2001. Dr. Bishop was a senior financial economist in the vision of insurance at the FDIC. 
Between 1991 and 1996, Dr. Bishop was a senior economist at the, uh, the WIFA group. Thank you very much. The WIFA group in the regional uh, consulting and forecasting group where he managed the state and metropolitan area forecasting services and worked with clients on numerous consulting projects. Dr. Bishop is a, men a member of the American Society of Association Executives, as am I, the American Economic Association, the American Real Estate Society, and the American Real Estate and Urban Economics Association. Dr. Bishop earned his PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Urbana <coughs> Champaign. What's wrong with Harvard and all the great schools? And that's all right. And resides in Alexandria, Virginia. Tom Golden, sitting in the uh, third chair, state representative from Lowell. Tom is currently serving as state representative for the 16th Middlesex District, which includes Lowell and Chelmsford. Throughout his career at the State House, at the State House Tom has served on various committees such as banks and banking, revenue, health care, energy, public safety, and chair of the House Committee on Bills in the third reading. He currently is serving as vice chair of election laws and is a committee member on community development and small business as well as steering policy and scheduling. As state representative, Tom has had the opportunity to work on projects that have been significant in the revitalization of the greater Lowell area. And have I mentioned that he is a realtor as well. A great friend in the legislature, uh, we have Tom Golden. So please, a, a round of applause for all three of our <laughs> panelists today. And as we have with the other panels, I'm going to ask each panelist, if they will, to provide a short uh, introduction to uh, how we can improve things, how we can sustain uh, the future, the political environment, um, anything you would like to say about housing and economic development. I will start with the Secretary, if I, if I may. Great. Secretary Thanks, Secretary Bialecki. So uh, picking up off what you said about uh, uh, the sustained, characterized the administration having a sustained com commitment to housing, and, and that's really where I wanted to begin uh, as well by saying. Uh, that even though we've been through quite a time uh, in the housing markets in the last uh, three years, um, that fundamentally I would describe where we are thinking um, as being on largely on the same track when it comes to housing, when it comes with respect to housing policy in Massachusetts. Uh, I think originally the governor took a very uh, long-term view towards the importance of housing uh, in the Commonwealth. Uh, he, uh, almost five years ago now, one of the first things he did in office was to rearrange uh, the executive branch so that housing and economic development would be in the same uh, secretariat, uh, both so that functionally uh, the folks who were doing housing and the folks who are doing business development uh, would interact in a lot of productive ways, um, but also uh, symbolically, if you will, uh, showing that housing was an integral part, was going to be an integral part, part of our uh, economic success and uh, that if we did not address uh, the housing needs uh, of our workforce, we're not going to be economically successful. And if we did, that would be a tremendous advantage to being economically successful. Uh, and also rearranging the departments in a way that made clear that uh, in Massachusetts, the state involvement in housing uh, had historically largely been an involvement in uh, that part of the housing market that was affordable, in other words, formally subsidized, formally res uh, restricted as to rent or price, and uh, making very clear that uh, he wanted our uh, secretary and his administration to be involved not only with that kind of affordable housing, but thinking about uh, market rate housing as well and the importance of uh, market rate housing to our economic success. So uh, I'll just briefly mention, I think, five uh, parts of our philosophy and approach that, were, that we, we took back in 2007 um, before the Great Recession. And uh, notwithstanding everything that's happened, we still think uh, are very much the, the markers of what we're trying to do. Uh, first, and most importantly, I guess, is that uh, we still feel we need to have a housing production policy and a housing production agenda. You could say with everything that's happened, uh, the given the prices, uh, the amount of time houses are on the market and so forth, that we really uh, don't need to worry uh, about housing production anymore. And we think that, again, being the long-term thinkers that we are, um, that if you look at uh, the Massachusetts economy and where we uh, want to be and need to be, that that is not uh, true. We need to deal with the short-term issues, but uh, our, uh, we, in the short term, we have the good fortune that our prices um, have not fallen and the housing uh, recession hasn't been as severe here in other regions of the country. Um, if that's the good short-term news, long-term, it means that our 
the challenges of our relative affordability or inaffordability are as great or greater than ever and will be uh, for the coming years. So we do need to have, continue to have a policy uh, that encourages and promotes and thinks about uh, housing production. Um, secondly, uh, we always felt that that uh, uh, agenda included home ownership, and we continue to feel so uh, today. If you look at the very short-term view of where the markets are headed, obviously right now you're seeing a lot more demand uh, on the rental side than on the home ownership side, um, and that is a real phenomenon, no doubt about that, but we think also that's attributable to some short-term uh, factors, and we think that uh, to have a healthy and prosperous Massachusetts economy, we need more housing production. Uh, and that in the long run includes continued focus, not just on rental opportunities, but on home, op home ownership opportunities as well. Uh, a third element of that, and I think you addressed it already in your program earlier today, is that we think of uh, when we have a housing agenda, we're thinking of it not, uh, we're thinking it for every community and region of the state. Uh, and that does uh, include our older industrial cities, and that for a lot of uh, at times the prescriptions that one has for uh, how to increase the economic prosperity uh, of our older industrial cities, uh, those agendas don't necessarily include attention to housing. But uh, we think, and I hope the representative will agree for Lowell, that, and we worked with him on projects, that having um, a housing policy that invites, encourages, welcomes uh, folks from uh, all different income levels, all different levels of education attainment, all levels of occupation, uh, to feel there are uh, housing options that fit them and suit them and their families uh, and invite them into our older industrial communities is an important part of their long-term economic health um, as well. Uh, fourthly, when we think about having a uh, housing production agenda, we focus on the fact that we think, although there are a number of factors involved for Massachusetts, frankly, it's primarily over-regulation um, that is causing uh, the market not to meet the needs. Sorry about that. It's together. Um, not, not to meet the needs of where we want to be. And uh, so we are, uh, we are focused on that, both in the work that we are doing to work with communities to use the levers and tools that we have available uh, as an administration. Uh, to let communities know that we are looking at uh, what their housing policies are and the degree to which their policies are through overregulation, increasing the cost of housing, that we um, are keeping an eye on that, that we're encouraging them to do otherwise, that with respect to the levers and tools that we have, including state investments of infrastructure, we are guiding those investments based on whether communities uh, have local housing uh, policies and rules, zoning and planning. Uh, that conform to where the state uh, needs to be. Um, and we're also uh, working with a number of you in this room on uh, zoning reform uh, that would take that a step further and actually enhance uh, the tools and levers that we have as a state to make sure that local uh, municipal regulation when it comes to housing is in line uh, with our state's uh, housing agenda, uh, which is to encourage the continued development and uh, production of housing. And then the fifth point is we also think primarily, again, due to that uh, over-regulation. And by the way, I, I should say, hasten to add whenever I talk about uh, over-regulation at the local level that we are not, um, uh, we are far from pretending that we are not blameless in that effort and there are many ways in which state regulation uh, also contributes to uh, the difficulty of development in Massachusetts, including residential development, including ways in which it drives up the cost of residential development. And, and we're, we need to work on that as well. Um, but the last point is to say that that uh, a number of factors, but again, primarily we think uh, overregulation is uh, causing a distortion in the types of housing and, and including home ownership opportunities that get built in Massachusetts um, and not uh, allowing the market to provide uh, a range of housing options, particularly for young people and young families um, that consumers want, uh, that, that you and others in, in the marketplace wish to provide. Um, but, but over-regulation at the state and local level is, is uh, interfering with those marketplace decisions in a way that's not uh, helpful to the competitive position of the state. So those are all things, as I said, that we thought uh, were true five years ago and we've been working on. We think despite recent experiences, all those things continue to be true and continue to be high-priority pr items for the state agenda. I think Rob mentioned state versus federal policies. I think those are all areas where we do need to keep an eye on what's happening uh, federally, but I think realistically 
Um, most of the work and change and improvement that needs to happen is here at the state and local level, and that's where our focus is. And then I'll just mention, uh, because we still are uh, struggling through a lot of the continuing issues of this great recession, that uh, we're also obviously focused on sh not just on those longer-term issues, but on short-term issues as well, uh, primarily uh, dealing with the continuing challenge of uh, foreclosures uh, and also with the issue of how uh, financial regulation and other issues are affecting the availability of finance for housing and for for housing development in general and for home ownership uh, in particular. And I'm glad to talk more about those as we continue the session. I would just point out that in those areas, that is more clearly an area where we have to keep an eye on both what's happening at the state and federal level uh, because those are uh, places where uh, we can make a difference at the state level. but. Uh, a large part of determining whether we're going to wind up in a better place um, in handling foreclosures um, and ensuring a continuing supply of, of housing finance depends greatly on what happens at the federal level. Thank you. Representative Golden. Thank you. you Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, let me just say that whatever you're in favor of with the number of projects we have in Lowell, I'm in favor of as well. <laughs> I think that's extremely important, so however we can do that. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's really a privilege to be here today, and I want to thank the association for inviting me here to, to uh, share my thoughts. As a, as a realtor in the Lowell area, you can imagine the challenges, uh, and I'm, I'm looking out at people shaking their head. We do have a lot of challenges throughout this area, throughout uh, my area as well as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. But um, talking about what is happening in the state and what is happening in the federal government, it uh, sometimes uh, overregulation. I think the secretary alluded to, and we've had a lot of good regulation, though, as well. I mean, some of the things with the $8,000 for the home buyers and piece, pieces like that, my office, or I shouldn't say my office, the office that I work for, uh, we experienced some, some, a really good jump start uh, at that point in time when that happened, when that money was, uh, was available. So I think some of the regulation is good, some of it not so good. And I think uh, some of it comes through uh, local regulation, how to get things done a little bit quicker. Uh, and I think that that's one of, the, one of the issues that we need to discuss, not only on the state level, but also on the um, local level as well. But the, uh, some of the other federal pieces that, uh, that have kind of hamstrung some folks uh, with the, Dodd Frank, the Frank Dodd piece, that I think is a challenge for each and every one of us. But I think the most important thing is to kind of have an open uh, communication back and forth. And I think in times like today, it's, it's, we have long-term, and I think that the Patrick administration, Patrick Murray administration, has done, has done a good job. It's extremely difficult to say that we're doing pretty well as the, as the Commonwealth goes, or we're doing very well from the 50 states, because we have just over a billion dollars in our rainy day account. And I say um, it's difficult to say that we're doing well, because so many folks, so many of our friends, so many of our neighbors are not doing well. And I think that's a real challenge. But Throughout the United States, it's important to know that the leadership, long term, is headed in the right direction. Um, that doesn't give a lot of comfort to a young man that I just spoke to coming down uh, the pike just a few moments ago. He's in the process of losing his home. And that's just uh, something that hopefully nobody in this room, hopefully you understand it, but hopefully you've never had to go through it. As a state representative, the unfortunate thing is uh, we're called on a lot to try to intervene, to try to help, to try to point people in the right direction. And that's one of the directions that I can't wait for the future, that that doesn't happen any longer. But I think that can only happen if we continue to, to increase jobs. There, are, I believe the, the formula is somewhere along the line of for every two homes sold, there's a job or a job and a quarter added. Uh, we're not doing that right now, at least in my office. I know that we have some real superstars that are doing great, but the majority of realtors that I know are really struggling, which means People are struggling, and it's most certainly not because of the interest rates. There's no question about that. Uh, the interest rates, I think, are all, at all all-time low. I think some of the problems that we're having is obviously with refinancing, uh, getting people into newer homes or homes that actually suit their ability or their, their, their style at this point in time, but they can't get out of these homes. Um, so I'm here to listen. I'm here to answer any questions that, uh, that you have. I'm very excited to be here, and I just want to say thank you very much for the opportunity. Very good. Paul Bishop. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to, I think, bring a couple of strands together from what we heard this morning and, and focus a little bit on the political environment in Washington, since there was some discussion of that in, in passing this morning, and also uh, touch on some of the economics. You uh, saw a very good presentation of where we're at with the economy overall. 
But I think I want to bring those two together in, in the sense that we're basically a very divided nation, both economically and politically. And so, on the, on the first point in terms of economically, it's certainly clear that we're in the midst of a period of very slow growth, and you know, many consumers are actually fearful we're, we're going to be headed into another recession. But when you look at how the economy is doing at various places across the country, you see a slightly different picture in the sense that there are areas of the country that are doing relatively well. So if you're a voter in Bismarck, for example, your perspective on what's going on in the economy is probably a lot different than if you're a voter in Las Vegas where you're uh, concerned about uh, your own job, the local economy, maybe you're unemployed, given that in Nevada the unemployment rate is in the mid-teens at this point. So from the perspective of the American voter, there's a different, different view of what's going on depending on where you're at. And in terms of the housing market in particular, there's certainly a wide variety of what's going on in terms of performance as well. Uh, in the 150 metro areas that we track on a quarterly basis, uh, and we uh, track those median prices in 150 metro areas, out of those 150, about 40 of them are showing positive gains in year-over-year -year prices. So there is a sense that there are areas doing much better even in terms of the housing market than there are in those areas that we're all familiar with that are not doing as well. So if, again, from the perspective of the typical American out there, there's a sense that depending on where you're at, whether things are going relatively well or, or not so well at, at the same time. To, to look at that in terms of how that relates to the political process and what we need to do in terms of moving forward, we recently completed a survey and we asked uh, a representative sample of American voters about the importance of the housing uh, market to the overall economy. And 71% of voters agreed that the economy will not improve until the housing market is on track. So despite this diversity in terms of how people view the economy in their own neighborhood, there's a clear consensus among voters that we need to get the housing market on track before the rest of the economy is going to improve. And so that uh, includes people, doing, uh, people in areas that are doing relatively well as, as well as uh, in th those areas where the economy isn't doing as well. So we're divided in terms of our economy, but yet there is this recognition among the typical voter out there that in fact we need to get the housing market on track before we can hope to have a stronger economy going forward over the long term. In terms of the political aspect of all of this in the political realm, the American uh, voter may know that we need to do something but it runs into the brick wall of what's going on in Washington. You heard the term dysfunctional thrown around earlier in terms of the political system in Washington, and, and I think in many ways that's the, the diplomatic way of describing what's going on in terms of the divide that we see uh, in the polarization in terms of viewpoints, not only on housing, but just in terms of how we move forward with the economy overall. You know, we saw that probably as clearly as ever with the debt ceiling debate earlier this summer in terms of the polarization and the uh, point we almost got to a pretty significant crisis in the financial markets, but for the fact that, that there was an agreement at the very last minute to move forward to raise the debt ceiling. And while that's one particular example, that's pretty representative of the type of political dysfunction that we see on a regular basis on maybe some of those issues that don't get as much headline as, as the uh, debt ceiling debate did a few months ago. And one, you know, there's a couple reasons why that's probably the case. First of all, the Congress is divided politically. There is, you know, 100. Uh, 92 Democrats in the House of Representatives and 242 uh, Republicans. So the Republicans hold a majority in the House. In the Senate, there's 51 Democrats, two that caucus with the Democrats, so 53 that are likely Democrat uh, votes in terms of their uh, political philosophy, and 47 Republicans. But in order to get anything done at all meaningfully in the Senate, you need 60 votes on most anything. So there's a, a lack of, of consensus and a lack of willing to compromise in many cases that prevents us from ever getting 60 votes on any single piece of legislation that might uh, move us forward on the economy or on housing, whatever the case may be. So that's, that's the second part of that. And one of the results of that, of course, is from that typical American voter out there in Bismarck or Las Vegas or Tampa or Boston, there's a clear sense that the political system isn't up to par to solve our problems. The approval rate of Congress now is in the low teens, and that's pretty consistent whether you ask uh, voters who are Republican or Democrat. They basically don't think Congress is up to, uh, up to the task of moving forward in a positive way to solve the problems that we, we see. So we have a deeply economic, divided economic system, a divided political system, and what that, I think, results in is a question of Who's to blame for what we're going through at this point? So there's a desire to find the villain, whether you're talking about the 
collapse in, in uh, the economy early on with the financial sector, the troubles we've seen in the housing market over the last few years, there's very much a sense that we need to find a villain. And depending on which newspe newspaper you read and whether it has a political viewpoint on the right or the left, you're almost certainly finding a different uh, villain every time you read an op-ed in any of those papers. So there's this desire to find the villain to blame the problems we see. And that's you know, really uh, magnified by the fact that the political system is as polarized as it is, so that you can uh, definitely see the case where Fannie and Freddie have been uh, tagged with the blame for everything that has happened in the housing market. Then in, in the political uh, sense, then there's a pile on in terms of how we go, up, go forward with uh, dealing with Fannie and Freddie and how quickly, how quickly we go ahead with uh, resolving their, their status at this point uh, as, as uh, a ward of the government at this, at this stage. And then the final thing I would say is we're looking for a villain. The question is, among, uh, say, homeowners is one example, who is really uh, deserves assistance at this point? There is a sense that not everyone who finds themselves in the difficulties that they find themselves in, whether because of the economy or underwater in their mortgage, whatever the case may be, not everyone is necessarily deserving of assistance. There is a sense that uh, some people played fast and loose with the rules, so they maybe aren't deserving of, of any uh, assistance, whatever form that may be. Others are uh, sense that they were kind of victims of circumstance, so we need to help them the best we can. And it boils down to a very strong political divide once again. In a you know, recent survey that we did, we asked whether or not we think the federal, whether the voters think the federal government is doing enough to help uh, homeowners who are either in foreclosure or at the risk of foreclosure. And overall, about half of Americans said they didn't think the federal government was doing enough at this point. But when you break it down along uh, political lines, uh, among Democrats, 68% said they think the government isn't doing enough, while 40% of Republicans said they think the government isn't doing enough. So there isn't even a consensus at this point about helping homeowners to the extent to which assistance is not only deserved, but uh, that homeowners maybe merit some assistance, even those who are uh, struggling to uh, hang on to their home <coughs> at this point. So there is a sense here of, of a lot of uh, polarization, a fairly deep political divide, and all of this is confronting a time when home ownership, as we heard earlier, is under assault from a lot of different directions. And so it's, it's coming in the form of questioning the mortgage interest deduction. It's coming in the form of questioning how we resolve Fannie and Freddie. It's coming in terms of uh, financial reform, in particular the qualified residential mortgage and the regulations that may flow from that. And there's a host of other issues that may not be directly related to housing, but certainly affect uh, the housing uh, sector uh, indirectly and certainly the ability of uh, the economy to move forward, whether in terms of uh, creating jobs or uh, uh, making uh, the economy more uh, robust than we've seen over the last uh, couple of years and hopefully giving those homeowners, again, out there in various parts of the country who are viewing the economy from a different perspective, a sense that we're on the right track and moving forward. You know, unfortunately, at this point, the typical voter out there doesn't see that. Uh, you know, and, and uh, the uh, approval rate, as I said, of Congress is in the low teens, and that's really pretty representative of how, how the voter thinks about the near-term future and our ability to get out of this box through the, uh, through the, uh, uh, the work of, of Congress and the other uh, regula regulators and the, and the political machinery that's at work in Washington at this point. So it's, it's, a, it's a box I'm not sure we're going to get out of in terms of the politics of it, even though there is a fairly strong consensus that housing has to come first before we get the economy moving again. All right, so let's take a peek at, the, at this box and, and try, to, try to find our way out of it a little bit. Um, you mentioned, um, is government doing enough? One of the chief tenets of, in, in, uh, of physicians uh, in the medical profession is a uh, first do no harm. Um, there, is, there are a lot of uh, proposals right now, both federally and at the state level, to, uh, to, to try to help things along, but some of it could be doing harm. Uh, there, are, there are proposals to change the mortgage interest deduction. There are proposals under the Dodd-Frank Act that was mentioned earlier um, to uh, require uh, a, a higher down payment. Um, I know at the state level we're thinking of a number of things uh, related to regulation that might improve uh, that, that might improve things, and I will I will say that uh, there are med many federal and state laws and regulations, and even local ordinances, that are negatively impacting the the banks, the good local the, the banks that remain, the good local banks that are there, and mortgage lenders left to deal with the uh, the mess that was uh, created by 
by others and, and, uh, and Wall Street. So I guess the question is, is what can be done without doing harm? Um, so first, do no harm. What can be done to get us out of this box, both at the federal and state level, related to some of the things I talked about? Paul, I'll start with you. I think it, it, the most, one of the more immediate things, and, and this falls in the certainly do no harm category as opposed to the more positive direction we'd like to, to see things move, is has to do with mortgage interest deduction. And uh, with the talk of tax reform and what that might uh, look like, uh, especially as the super committee uh, uh, comes to its uh, conclusions and provides its proposals to Congress, uh, there's, uh, of course, real concern about uh, what they're going to propose as far as uh, the mortgage interest deduction is concerned. And I guess one of the things I want to touch on again that goes back to the political divide we see among our leaders is really goes to the understanding of some of these issues more at a deeper level than simply the broad maybe news bite sound. And MID is a perfect example of that. Uh, invariably, when I've been at a conference and a critic of MID talk, starts talking about why the mortgage interest deduction is a bad thing, up on the screen comes a $5 million mansion and uh, this is what your MID tax dollars bought, and you know that, that type of demagoguery in terms of uh, the value of MID. And that translates very much into how the political leaders view this in many ways, that it's, uh, you know, it's something unnecessary, it only goes to the wealthy. But if you simply look at the data, you know that's not the case. So for example, there are 75 million homeowners out there. Uh, 51 million have a mortgage, so the rest have paid off their mortgage or, or paid cash initially for their home. So out of that 51 million with a mortgage, 39 million take advantage of the mortgage interest deduction. So about three quarters of the uh, people who have a mortgage take advantage of the mortgage interest deduction. And in some additional work we did, we also asked, even if you don't take the mortgage interest deduction today, have you ever taken it in the past? So for example, if you've owned your home for 20 years, perhaps you, you aren't really eligible to take the mortgage interest deduction, or certainly it isn't in your best interest as far as filing taxes to deduct your mortgage interest. So there's another 16% of people who have had some experience or the mortgage interest deduction has touched them in a positive way. So it's, it touches a broad swath of people, not just as you might uh, read in some of the, uh, the headlines or some of the comments of the critics, only the wealthy take advantage of it. 65% uh, of those who take MID earn less than $100,000 a year. So again, that uh, level of, uh, I guess, uh, fact, and it's not a hard fact to find, is completely missed in a lot of the discussions in the, in, the, in the politics of the issue. And so at a very real level, we're trying to provide that information, and again, in the do no harm category, make sure that these, uh, many of these inaccurate perceptions about the mortgage interest deduction is one example, don't find their way into some type of policy proposal meant to uh, accomplish something that really doesn't need to be accomplished critics view, take away the mortgage interest deduction because only the wealthy benefit from it. Well, that's not really the case as far as the facts are concerned, so it's a matter, again, to use your term of doing no harm, make sure that we are, I guess, operating more so in a defensive position at the national level to make sure that the, le <coughs> the legislator, legislators and policymakers have a better sense of really what the issues are. Uh, to the extent that when they are talking about these proposals, they know what the longer-term ramifications may be. And it's not always clear in some of these other issues that that, 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 that is the case. If you've uh, ever had the chance to uh, tune into C-SPAN and watch a congressional hearing about a topic in finance or, or housing where representatives are, are questioning uh, someone who's testifying, there, it's pretty clear that there are many members of our elected bodies that have very little understanding beyond a rudimentary sense of what's going on in finance as to what the ramifications of what they're discussing, some of the proposals out there, what they really mean. So it's a matter of playing defense and hopefully preventing uh, bad things from happening. And these are, uh, you know, I guess uh, where we're at now at the national level is, uh, you know, like I said, do no harm at this point. Secretary Bialecki. You are Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, clearly a, a nexus. What, what, what's your thought about? Um, well, one point for context, just say I, I want to point out uh, that what, what Paul talked about, about the differences across the country and the, and the way in which people's different experiences uh, are, are causing them to have different perspective on the issues. And uh, that is true in Massachusetts as well, and, and the representative mentioned that on average, uh, the good news is Massachusetts is 
recovering much more strongly than the rest of the country, adding jobs much faster than, than the rest of the country. And that's, that's we were bringing up the rear in the recession of 2001. So overall, that's very good news for the state. But even though we're a small state, we still have a tremendous variation in people's perspective. I could introduce you to 20 uh, small business CEOs uh, who would have told me or the governor in the last few months, my number one problem is I just can't hire good people fast enough. That's, that's what the recovery means to me. I could also introduce you to dozens of uh, small business CEOs who would say, what recovery? I'm not seeing it. My sales are, are flat. So uh, those are, you can't marginalize either of those folks. You have to acknowledge that those are, they are both representing where we are today. Uh, in Massachusetts, in the country as a whole, as Paul said, but in, in Massachusetts as well, and, and that really affects how we think about the policies. Um, I, I guess the one other comment I want to add is that um, I do think you talked about uh, villainizing, and, and I guess I would talk about sort of moralizing a little bit, and the, the uh, I think the undue effect um, that it has had on, on pragmatic policy decision making, and, and for example, in the area of uh, what to do. Uh, about foreclosures and folks with troubled loans, and I'm, I am worried that we are a lot of the discussion about what to do uh, with uh, loans that are in trouble actually has, is not, are not proposals that are pragmatic thinking about how do we uh, clear the markets. And, and for my sake, because I'm looking for the overall economy, yes, every case of an individual who's a homeowner, there's a personal story there. But in the bigger picture also, as Paul was mentioning, it's just undeniably true as an economy now, we're not really going to have a better recovery than we're having unless we unstick the housing markets. And so it's not just a matter of helping an individual homeowner. It's this enormous inventory of houses that are frozen in the marketplace, whether they are uh, underwater and there's no foreclosure but they're underwater or they're uh, in default or they're in foreclosure. Um, that uh, there, as long as they are stuck, we're not going to do much better than we can. And we, I'd like to see us without, I don't have any particular answers, but I'd like to see some options being presented that are pragmatic and realize the sense of urgency about where we are. Uh, instead, I see the conversations about what to do with homeowners who are in trouble tend to be very moralizing. Well, they, as, as Paul said, you, um, you're trying to help people who should have known better or who overextended themselves and so forth. And just by comparison, um, and I appreciate those points, and they're not small points, but I would say by comparison, when you looked at the state of our large financial institutions in this country, um, there were a whole lot of, lot of moralizing that you could do about whether it was uh, appropriate or fair uh, to spend a lot of public money to provide financial assistance to large, privately capitalized, risk-taking financial institutions. Um, and I think, I personally believe that it was in the best interest of the country to say those are important principles, um, but uh, if in fact we allow those principles to say that nobody's too big to fail and that everybody's just going to go under, um, the country would be in very dire shape right now. And I think we, I would like to see us have the same sense of urgency right now about what's happening in the housing market as being the major impediment uh, to a better recovery than we're having. Uh, and to have a conversation about whether there's some pragmatic things we can do uh, to open up the housing market and not ignore uh, the principles at stake. Um, but I, I'd rather see us be more pragmatic and uh, to get things moving. Here, here. Right. Thank you. Uh, to follow up on a point that both gentlemen brought up, uh, we're talking about nationally how people feel different in one section of the country to the other. That can happen in your, in your office, uh, on your street. When I talk to constituents, uh, I think they're divided into three three different types of people when you talk about the economy. The first person is, seems to be doing well. The, econ the economy is, has treated them well. Uh, they see some growth. The second person is keeping their head down and just moving forward, trying not to, in some instances, be noticed and just kind of survive. And the third person is the person that is um, absolutely being um, uh, terrorized by, by this economy. And that being said, with some of the choices that are out there on the federal level. I would say from the state level, this doesn't happen. And I can only really speak to the state level, not working down in Washington. But in the state level, this doesn't happen as much. The polarization of, of any one issue, any uh, pragmatic approach that comes forward immediately starts to get shot down. And I, I see paralysis kicking in 
where people are shooting from the left, the right, the center. You don't even know where the, the enemies are, are coming from. And quite frankly, at times, you don't even know why they're coming. Uh, we're trying to find the answer. And I think from a political standpoint or from an elected official standpoint, I think at times that um, a lot of folks believe, truly believe that we have the answers or should have the answers. Uh, that's not true. The only way we really get the answers is by talking to people out in the uh, communities or out in different areas to try to find out why aren't we try trying something like this. Uh, but once again, you, you know, paralysis does kick in. Someone pops their head up and I'm imagining, I, I'm responding to a lot of what I read in the newspapers, as many of you, from the federal. Uh, someone sticks their head up from the, the, from the foxhole and they're immediately being shot at wondering what is going on. What do you, why would you possibly even consider making that, um, making that suggestion? To that I can say, uh, obviously as an elected official, we need to hear from, from you. To my colleagues who are elected officials, well, sometimes you have to stand up and say, let's start throwing things against the wall, not necessarily to say this is going to be the policy, but to try to get a discussion plan. I mean, I'm sure many of you have had uh, instances in your own offices where you maybe all meet, I know we do this in my office, just to throw things against the wall to find out what is going to stick, what's going to happen, what's going to be helpful. We do this probably once a month, and you know, 90% of the ideas are yeah, okay. We never try to say they're bad ideas, but, and then we try to follow up on some, some of the other ideas or some of the other um, thoughts of how to, how to invigorate some of our, our market share. But um, I think the biggest problem right now, and it's on the federal level, not so much in the state, and this is a debatable topic. We even have uh, uh, discussions in our, own, uh, in our own party back and forth when we're, when we're trying to pass something. But uh, I think the federal government truthfully needs to stop the, uh, uh, the division. And I think that's what the, elect the electoral is going to look for at the end. Good. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask a question here, and then I'll, I'll open it to all of you. So think about some, um, some questions that you may have for, uh, for our panelists today. Another question for all of you. We, uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe a few years ago, we, we met with the, uh, uh, some representatives from Medical Society, and we've met with other business groups as well. And one of the things that quite, quite frankly surprised, surprised us was how important affordable housing is across all spectrums, that it is, it is a, an issue across all spectrums of, of society, certainly in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So... Um, uh, for, uh, how should we address workforce for, uh, for a sustainable economy, housing economy? How should we address specific workforce housing needs with concerns about affordability, commuting time, possible incentives like employer-assisted housing, other kinds of things like that? And maybe I'll start with uh, with the secretary. Yeah. So, I, so it, it obviously, and that, and that, as my earlier remarks, I hope conveyed that um, that was something that five years ago we heard from a lot of folks as being an important issue and I was trying to convey in my remarks that um, it may seem too soon to be talking about those issues of uh, housing shortages or housing scarcity or pressure on rents or prices, uh, but it's not and, and part of it is, again, we talked about different pockets and regions and income points, but we're certainly seeing that uh, in, in many of those segments that uh, we're seeing the return to the pressure, and, our, and we have to be concerned, again, uh, about that there are enough uh, reasonably priced housing options, as you say, for folks at, at uh, every point in the spectrum. And, and we have tried to focus on more broadly that workforce housing and not just the traditional you know, 80 percent of median income affordable housing slice that we've focused on before. Um, we, are, we are tailoring, uh, to some degree, um, we are really we are working with the business community and with the real estate development community, and we are trying to take our cues from them. So, for example, uh, back in 2007, uh, when the governor first came in office, there was enough pressure in the housing uh, markets and among employers that we were beginning to see the rise of private employers taking to providing uh, homeownership incentives and support. Uh, which we thought was a great idea, and we thought the best thing that we could do was to offer to participate or match those kind of programs. Um, and we actually developed a pilot pro project to do that. And then, of course, two years later, um, no employer was interested in, in offering that kind of program anymore, um, for, you know, for all the right reasons. So we backed off as well. Um, but one of the things we're exploring right now is uh, I think we want, to, we want to be partners with the private sector on that. So we are, once again, starting to talk to employers. And if we are, in fact, 
the market cues are suggesting that we're uh, in that place again with particular uh, kinds of jobs for particular industries, for particular uh, housing markets. Um, that that is an issue that the employers see as affecting their ability to recruit and retain, retain people, and they are willing, once again, to start thinking about putting some skin in the game. We would be glad to help out with that, too. Outstanding. That's great. Thank you, Paul. Well, some of you may be aware, I mean, the National Association has had a housing opportunity program now for quite some time, and one of the focuses of that is to look at various options for uh, affordable housing, employer-assisted housing, and uh, other ways that makes housing affordable, not just for lower income people, but middle income people as well, and, and this trade off between uh, housing costs and transportation. And uh, you know, one of the amazing things about that uh, program has been that there's been a lot of very creative programs and activities and solutions virtually in every part of the country. And in fact, I have a, a, a summary of, uh, of some of those programs and, and the extent to which realtors are involved with that. In, at their local level, and it, it shows a tremendous amount of variety in terms of how to tailor some of those programs to the needs of the local community. And uh, it's, it's uh, something I can certainly be happy to follow up with, uh, with anyone after uh, uh, the, the discussion here today, but certainly there's a role for realtors to be leaders in their community, and we have some very specific examples that uh, you may find useful something happening in Atlanta or, or uh, San Francisco that may be applicable to uh, community uh, where you're at. And then, of course, there's outside of, of uh, you know, uh, employer-assisted housing and workforce housing specifically, there's uh, various uh, types of programs that uh, are more prominent in certain areas of the country than, other, than the other. You know, um, community housing trusts where a third party comes in and basically uh, takes uh, some abandoned property and, and builds affordable housing units on that and has an extended land lease so the cost of the potential home buyer is much less simply because the land is taken out of that and then there's an equity sharing agreement once that home is sold in the future. And then there's the concept of land banking where um, uh, abandoned uh, properties are, are taken, uh, a third party takes possession of them and then uh, they're uh, marketed to a developer. And again, most of that activity is designed to prevent blight in a particular community from spreading. So that also holds and, and has the, the benefit of, of retaining housing values going forward so that the community itself is able to provide the housing more easily than it would be in a situation where you have a community that's struggling. And uh, so there's you know, a number of options along those lines, but I think the key to keep in mind here is there's lots of activity at the local level that you may not uh, be aware of, and uh, you know, probably some of those uh, programs could be applied uh, fairly close to home. Thank you. Uh, I would believe that if I can put a plug in for the city of Lowell, I think the city of Lowell has done a great job uh, with this, and this hasn't been over the last two or three years. It's been probably 10 years plus. I would encourage anybody that uh, is involved in real estate or from a municipality, and if you're interested in, in learning more about what is going on in the city of Lowell, don't hesitate to grab me before the end, and we'll get you in contact with the right people. What is, what is happening? Uh, Merrimack Valley Har Housing Partnership, which many of you all, all know about, uh, they, do, they do a great job in uh, introducing and helping and educating first-time home buyers how to purchase, when to purchase, and in, in a lot of instances, not to purchase because that person particularly may not be ready at that point in time. We have things like the Lowell Plan that uh, provide down payment assistance. So when you're talking about uh, those, all the local banks getting together to put some money together, to help people buy within the uh, city limits. So trying to help with uh, any type of mixed housing, I think the, the city has done it right. I've talked to many of my colleagues throughout the Commonwealth, whether they be from right here in Worcester or Brockton or Lynn, uh, and discussions about how uh, we do it, how they do it, and how to make it uh, that much better. But when it comes to affordable housing, the cities have really taken the lead, I believe, in turning over some of these old mills. Uh, the city of Lowell, for a number of years, was the uh, textile, uh, the history of the textile. You know, we have more, uh, more mills than I think anybody throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and we've had the opportunity to turn them around. We've turned them around because the Secretary has put together some plans uh, to allow us to do that through uh, low-income tax credits with housing and things of that nature, uh, Secretary Galvin through uh, the historical tax credits. But I think the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a whole has really uh, stepped up to the plate to make, to, to make issues like that more affordable. When developers come in, 
we were talking to, to uh, some developers just the other day, and they're looking at, once again, moving forward and changing uh, part of uh, Jackson Street, which uh, is one of our main areas that we're focusing on right now. But this, has, this doesn't happen overnight. This is definitely a long-term approach, and I know uh, my comments earlier were the Secretary knows the City of Lowell very, very well. We're up there uh, discussing with him on uh, more than one occasion, uh, a month, I would say, maybe, <laughs> about what needs to be done. And I would, uh, I would strongly suggest to any of you that to, if you're interested or if you have any uh, interest in this type of uh, development, that you should be talking to uh, the Secretary or even myself, and we can point you in the right direction. Because affordable housing is definitely uh, something that is needed, especially since we're, we are slowly but surely coming out of the recession that we're in. Thank you. Right. Right. Can I add one other thing? Yes, please. Which is just to pick up on something uh, Paul said, which is uh, it's been interesting to me that um, as you look at what, for lack of a better term, I'm just going to say pro-housing policies we could think about implementing at the state or local level in Massachusetts, there are a lot of very interesting models um, from uh, some of the big metropolitan regions around the country. Um, and one of the interesting uh, contrasts between them and us it's not just in the details of the programs they're initiating, but from what I've seen, Paul, when you look behind uh, who are the drivers of those initiatives, it wasn't just sort of the predictable industry groups, in other words, um, the realtors and the home builders and the, and the real estate developers. Um, you'll find in a lot of those other places, something in Chicago, for example, the, the major employers are key members of those uh, business coalitions in support of these kind of pro-housing policies because of the need to uh, house their workforce. That's something that by and large hasn't happened as much in Massachusetts and we find that when uh, we are advocating for pro-housing policies we have always reliable friends and partners uh, in the room and, and others who are involved in, in housing and real estate development. Um, but I think that's something for all of us to think about, about whether uh, in Chicago the large universities and hospitals were actually uh, probably the key drivers, I think, from the story that I've heard behind um, some workforce housing uh, initiatives in the uh, uh, metropolitan Chicago area and so forth. And I think we would all benefit if we had a, a broader coalition of businesses. There clearly is interest when the governor and I talk one-on-one -on -one, uh, to those employers about what their issues are. They do mention that they're aware of the issue. It does affect uh, their ability to grow. Um, but it is not, they, we have not had, the, uh, they have not been um, as forceful uh, public advocates for these issues, and I think that's an opportunity for us. Yeah, oftentimes we can learn from each other. We just talked to, uh, w uh, with Lieutenant Governor's uh, presentation. We talked a little bit about a, a, pr a program in Baltimore where municip municipalities can better dispose of, of, uh, of, of their properties by putting it into the marketplace. Paul, how, do, how, do, how does Massachusetts fare uh, with other states in your research uh, in terms of the economy and, and, uh, and how housing is going to come out of this uh, more quickly? Well, I think there's a lot of, as you saw earlier, a lot of positive uh, movement and a lot of things that uh, the state has uh, going for in terms of the economy, certainly compared to uh, some of the more hard-pressed regions. And, and uh, it's clear that when you look forward, forward uh, you know, several years, that in terms of affordability and access, there are certainly many opportunities. There's, there's some challenges, though, that I think we all should be uh, concerned about. And, uh, some of the, if you think about housing affordability, for example, and break it down into what its components are, and this touches on you know workforce housing as well as uh, the more more uh, traditional types of housing supply uh, available to uh, residents of the state. It is there are certain things that are un, that are not under anyone's control, and that's the cost of financing, you know, mortgage rates, those types of things. There are things that are more under uh, local control, and that's and, you know uh, access to the types of housing that uh, people want to buy and want to purchase and some of the uh, workforce uh, housing initiatives that uh, are not only present here but in other areas of the country that might might uh, uh, add to the long-term uh, not only supply of homes but make it uh, long-term uh, more affordable than it might be otherwise. And, you know, so there are certain things that we can control, certain things that we, we can't, but I think over the longer term, uh, given the, uh, you know, relatively productive and educated labor force that Massachusetts has that uh, over the long term um, the economy is going to do probably better 
than uh, many other areas of the country, and that's going to uh, support the housing market and a lot of other sectors of the economy, which, again, talk about this virtuous circle we heard about earlier this morning. Uh, there's more likelihood that we're going to be in the virtuous circle uh, sooner rather than later, I think, across, uh, across uh, Massachusetts. Let me ask a question, Representative Golden. As a realtor, putting your realtor hat on, legislator as well, but if you had a crystal ball and knowing what your agents are going through and what's happening in your office and all that, what are some of the things you would do uh, or recommend as a policymaker, but also as a realtor to the federal government or at the state level to the secretary, to, to improve, get us out of where we are right now, get us out of that box and, 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 and make housing uh, and, frankly, economic development uh, improve that much more? Well, from a housing standpoint, uh, the first thing, actually, next week I'm going to be meeting with some local bankers to find out how we can get people through that abyss where they're locked in, something that I had mentioned earlier, where they're locked into their home right now, their current home, and it's not working for them any longer, yeah. where they have percentages that they just, if they're going to sell it, they're going to sell it for a loss. Yeah. How can you possibly take that dollar figure? Can you move it? Can you move it with them? Uh, this was actually brought up once again by a local banker, a president of one of my lo local banks up there, to say that if he was given the opportunity to take the Smith family and move them from this particular home to a new home uh, and the ability to carry that money forward, w would they be able to do it? That discussion is actually going to be happening next week. Um, you know, once again, this is a, the ability to use your ears more effectively than uh, your mouth and to try to listen to what the market is looking for. Uh, one of the pieces that, at least from the local bankers are, uh, are saying, is that they cannot help uh, some of their longtime customers just because simply that their homes are underwater and they do, they do need to move and they, they, can't get them, they can't get them the help that they need. If these folks are paying the, say, 7%, 8%, but they cannot refinance them down to the, the record lows that we're in now, uh, they're looking for that type of assistance, and hopefully uh, by next week I'll have an answer for you about how to get that accomplished. But uh, we do have that set up to, uh, to sit and discuss, and I know I'll be uh, calling the secretary with some of these ideas to see how we could possibly, possibly use some of this money that we have to leverage it. So. In our next panel, uh, we'll have a, uh, one of the panelists will be the chief economist for FHFA, which is the conservator <laughs> for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. What are some things that, that we that you would offer, ask him about? What, what kinds of things do you think FHA and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should be, should be, uh, should be doing to, to help Massachusetts? Well, I'm going back to your question of yeah. doing no harm, I think one of, the, one of the things that I would like to see more in the cycle is you've, I think we are realistically, because the situations are so different, community, community, region by region, I think it's useful to have some of the good thinking coming from the bottom up. We, we, I have found that both on the housing side and, frankly, on the small business lending side also, that a lot of times when you have a conversation uh, with the banking community, there is a willingness to do some things, to have some flexibility um, by them individually, but they feel that the current uh, either existing regulation or the threat of regulation doesn't give them the flexibility to, to do those solutions. So I, I think one of the things that... Uh, would like to see is to make sure that there is a, a willingness in, a, in the federal government and the various agencies expressing a greater willingness to be flexible if there are some more creative local solutions. Uh, because actually, obviously, for all the reasons that we've discussed and that you all know of, one of the enormous challenges to this uh, foreclosure situation and, and troubled loan situation, mortgage situation, is it just feels like everyone's situation is unique, yeah. you know, and that you can't. So you put a lot of effort into helping one homeowner figure out what's the right answer for them. And then your hope would be, okay, well, we figured that, we untied that knot, so that's got to be a lesson about how the next one's easier and the next one's easier than that. And I think of our experience and, and what we've tried to do, and I'm sure yours is too, is that's not the case. That's it's true. every time it, you can't, what would work for one individual or one family it can't seem to make it work because of the different circumstances. So I think that's, um, uh, we ought at this point acknowledge that we're not going to find uh, the silver bullet answer and that we need to uh, encourage and therefore and enable um, the banks that are willing 
to be creative and innovative and thoughtful about how to work out different solutions uh, to give them the room to do that and to have the uh, federal regulators uh, making those folks feel like if they're making responsible, maybe creative, but responsible decisions, um, that they get the flexibility to do that because other, there is not going to be uh, there's, there's not going to be an, any uh, rule that issues from the federal government that says just do things this way and it solves the problem. That we know now that's not going to happen. Yep. Great. Well, that came from the silver bullet theory that you were talking about. We were discussing what silver bullet is there, and that was brought forward by uh, a group of us just sitting there kind of talking over a cup of coffee. And then it started to say that the local solutions may, may very well be a better solution. Or it may be a competitive advantage, quite frankly, for a local bank that says, hey, we're willing to go this far, uh, you know, to help our, uh, our folks. So I think the local solutions, I think uh, if I can encourage anybody, um, trying to change something even on a statewide, and the Secretary would probably agree with this, or n nationally, is extremely difficult. Uh, the system by which we have, uh, I, I, I get this all the time, gee, why can't you just change this tomorrow? You know, it's, uh, it's meant to be difficult, and people hate to hear that, but the legislative process is meant to be difficult, it's meant to be vetted, it's meant to be slow. And uh, there's a lot of folks that don't like that when, when we say that, but that's just, that just happens to be the fact. The bicameral legislat legislators, the House, the Senate, and then the executive branch, uh, it does slow things down. And, and I have to honestly say, in some instances it's a good thing, it slows it down, in some instances it's not. But um, I think a local approach to this is a, a, better, a better idea, a better approach, and possibly solving uh, community issues because 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and I would venture to guess uh, 30 feel this way, 30 feel that way, and so on and so forth. That's right. Uh, again, I'm going to ask for questions now, so if you'd like to, just go to the mics, and, and I'll, I'll acknowledge you, but, and please do so. Um, you mentioned 351 cities and towns. Uh, home rule state, lack of uniformity in, in regulations. Uh, uh, developers always say that that one of the problems they have is is there's a lack of uniform, uniformity. There ought to be a little, a, a little more that you can count on um, toward um, a state that has more affordable housing and and uh, you know good economic development. What what are your thoughts about the future of uh, perhaps trying to get to a little more uniformity in, in some of the regulations? I'll start with you. I would say it's probably like a state's rights issue. So, you know, <laughs> cities and towns are very um, uh, very serious about holding their own form, you know, the municipalities want their own uh, control. Mm -hmm. And whenever we try to do something from a state level, even, even when it's something to do with uh, development, especially development, you can, all I have to do is mention the word 40B, and everybody right now either has a positive <laughs> or a negative thought of 40B. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be, I think, a, a, difficult, um, a difficult piece to say uniform, you know, there's going to be a uniform code of, of, of the way it's going to be uh, done in every city of town. Okay. Although, you know, I think it should be. Yeah. But um, I think it's going to be a, a difficult uh, thing to, um, to tackle. Difficult road, what do you think? Yeah, and I think we have the same uh, basic perspective, which is that uh, the, when we, on almost any subject, if you say that uh, the purpose of this bill um, is that the state is hereby mandating something right. for the cities and towns. You don't even get to finish the sentence before yeah. people conclude it's not. <laughs> Remember that way. shooting back and forth we were That's talking right. about earlier? Really, from it's all not areas. A good idea. So I think what we've done is, um, but on the other hand, we have, um, we've, we've started really fundamentally with what are the communities, uh, from that perspective, why, other than, a, in a, than an automatic negative response because the state is trying to tell a city and town what to do. Let's, let's look at this particular issue. Are we really um, absolutely at loggerheads or is there's possibility there's some alignment? And I think when we look more deeply at that, we see actually there's a whole spectrum of cities and towns in Massachusetts, uh, including ones that um, do feel that adding more housing um, and bringing new people in their community makes their communities stronger and better. Um, and so for starters, that's, uh, there's a number of communities that do uh, feel that way, and so we're working with them and encouraging them and saying uh, that maybe uh, we can't tell you what to do, but on the other hand, with respect to our resources that we have, um, it seems pretty logical and straightforward that we're going to give more resources to the communities that are working in alignment with us and doing things that uh, make the state better. I think it's there's, you can't really argue with the proposition that if even if it makes sense for your community, if you feel like it makes sense for your community not to 
be open to more housing. Um, if, if everybody did that, it would be ruinous for the state. I think yeah. everybody agrees with that. So it, it's a, you have a little leverage there to say that there's uh, some sense of responsibility and that if any one city in town just formulates its policies entirely based on what it sees for good, good it's it in isolation, that it's not going to be good for the Commonwealth. And if we, if, 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 uh, uh, if the over, if we don't have a prosperous and healthy and successful Commonwealth, then that affects all of us. So there's some, some communities, they say, that have, have expressed a real uh, interest in housing, and we, we encourage that, and we work with them very closely. And there's another set of communities that I think are, um, if you, again, try to take some of the moralizing out of it and be very practical. Um, some of the communities that are upset about 40B um, are not actually categorically opposed to housing, but they have a particular uh, reason for that. It's the, uh, the pace at which new housing is coming out of the community and so forth, uh, or the location. Some of that is um, more sincere in some cases than in others, but we're trying to take everybody in good faith and say, to, for example, to the extent that uh, if you as a community are willing to plan ahead yourself for new housing, then we're going to be very deferential to your plans as we make 40B decisions and other decisions at the state. If you're, in fact, uh, you, anytime there's a housing proposal, there's always a reason that you don't like it, well, then we know where you stand. But if you're genuinely interested in uh, prom promoting housing in a certain way, it depends on location, the scale at which it happens, um, we, we're going to take, we're going to meet you halfway on those projects. Good. Thank you, Paul. Anything to add or... Uh, Okay. <laughs> Stay out of that one, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, I'm Sean McGee. I work with for uh, MetLife Home Loans. And uh, first, wanted to say thanks for bringing such a great group of uh, dis distinguished uh, guest speakers for us, Mar and uh, Mass Housing. And uh, I like uh, uh, so many of the different topics here. I don't know where to really start, but I'd like to go back to some of the previous panels. Uh, topics on uh, jobs in the economy and uh, housing and uh, what Tom was just talking about locally here just brought to uh, while I was sitting over here thinking before he brought it out was uh, what Tip O'Neill had to say about politics being all local politics starts local and also it sounds like uh, housing is the biggest issue right now and housing if we start locally here in Massachusetts I think we can bring a model to the rest of the country because uh, one of our previous speakers talking about uh, the, uh, the Congress being so dysfunctional. doesn't look like Congress is going to get much done, but I believe here in Massachusetts we've got such a great start to maybe bring it nationally, whether it's in front of this administration or the next. And uh, as different people talked about different things that just brought so many different uh, uh, thoughts to my head and uh, what I really like about this type of conference is getting the information from uh, the experts, bringing it out to the field, spreading it to uh, city and towns and when you say start from ground up and have those ideas start locally, bringing them up and I think if we can create something here in Massachusetts may go even further. And uh, to your point uh, Greg, about short and long-term goals. What are some of these uh, short-term goals that we can achieve? And as my uh, business, the bulk of my business is renovation lending. I don't believe that there's enough uh, renovation lending that's a mainstream type product. And I think that if you really grind that renovation product down and say, how could we get create jobs, uh, people into housing, move the economy, and get people to buy by creating a, a house that needs five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand worth of work included in the mortgage. And the FHA product is certainly one of the best out there. The two hundred three k Mass Housing does a great job, but I don't think enough with purchase and renovate. There's the home path renovation. Tom, you would know as a realtor, these houses that are vacant that they need they need uh, some type of uh, work. Why can't we bring that into a uh, more mainstream type product to create jobs, housing opportunities? And uh, going back to the long term, you know, I'm glad that I got to uh, talk to you, but uh, 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 Tim Murray uh, was great to have him as a, uh, out here talking to us. Long term uh, type of uh, goals that I could see. Uh, we talked about uh, minorities uh, not having the housing opportunities as some of the uh, uh, whites, maybe the blacks, Hispanics, Asians. Why don't we, and, and I take this to you, Tom, to a challenge to bring in front of the legislature. 
to try to get this education put out to not just uh, uh, colleges and universities, but to high schools and elementary school students of people of color to say, how do you learn about credit in the seventh or eighth grade so that maybe these people that have been in uh, subprime loans didn't know enough okay. about how to okay. uh, get a loan, but now if you start educating the younger people yep. on how to build credit, don't get into such a yep. uh, mass of uh, debt or something that you couldn't... Uh, couldn't get out of, yeah, that's, but that's a long-term type thing where you could teach these kids sure. and bring it to uh, the education. And, and one last thing I'll bring okay. out is, because I don't want to yep. keep all your time. Yeah, I got it. Oh, so we were, we didn't, uh, any, nothing got funded positive in uh, the state except for education. Education was the only one that expanded in uh, opportunity. Why don't we take this education funds and bring this type of uh, thinking to the young people? And I'm not talking, like I say, college or university, right down to sure. grade school. And so that's what I'm uh, yeah, bringing I, to. There's a couple things A couple things with this. One of the, your first comment, I think, is something for all of us, and that is because we were invited here, uh, we're hoping that you take this information and bring it back home with you as well. I heard two questions there. One of them re relates to renovation finance. And we have, by the way, an adjunct uh, panelist over there. We have the CEO of the, of the Mass Bankers Association, who certainly has uh, 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 information about financing. But um, renovation financing, I guess, was one question. And the other one was economic education. Yeah. How do we bring um, information about how to get a loan, how to, how to stay, in a, stay in a home uh, to, to the younger people? Well, I think on uh, economic education, Thank I think you. That, that's, a, that's a real challenge, to be honest with you. But the Department of Education, with the limited number of hours that we have right now, that seems to have fallen by the wayside with civics. Uh, that really truly has happened uh, with the MCAS and things that we have here. What we do, once again, I, I'm speaking from a very local standpoint. From the city of Lowell, what we have is we have actually local banks that will go into a lot of the five through uh, fifth grade through eighth grade, talk about starting a, uh, a passbook. Actually, I'm dating myself. We don't wow. have passbooks. <laughs> we don't have Passbook passbooks. Account. But uh, a savings account and things of that nature. So I think a lot on the, on the private sector, that is picked up. Uh, a lot of people would be surprised to know that civics isn't really taught in schools right now. Uh, the UTEC, which is United Teen Equality Center in downtown Lowell, they're trying to push civics as a statewide mandate. That's happening actually as we speak. So when you talk about financial literacy or, or, or things like civics, that is a real discussion. But we're trying to put it into, and I should say jam it into a school day, um, that you know, we need to expand the hours of the day. That being said, once again, I'm going to go back to Merrimack Valley Housing Partnership, which is up in my area, which does a great job in trying to educate people. But I do take your uh, comment, fifth through, through eighth grade, you know, it should be happening. It is happening a little bit from the, from the private sector. Private but sector there is a lot of, there's life smarts, there's a uh, right. uh, stock market game, there's lots of stuff that, that you can introduce to schools if, they have, if the teachers have the time. If to, the teachers want to try to bring it in, but exactly. from our perspective, the local banks do do that. They, yeah. They try to get into the school, obviously, you know, uh, to try to teach financial literacy. Yeah, yeah. And our um, Division of Consumer Affairs has been working, working with mass bankers to uh, develop more, better financial literacy programs. I mean, there's no question if they, what people have focused on as a consequence of, uh, of the recession has been this question of did we have the right amount of financial regulation? People talking about that every day. In our view, there's an equally important question of did people have the right amount of financial education? Correct. Um, and I think it's probably equally true that we can conclude they did not. Um, and we've got to pay attention to that as well going forward. And we're, we're doing some things to keep doing it. On the rehab point, let me just say that's critical, obviously, or should, um, I don't want to say anything's obvious. Certainly to us, very important point of our housing strategy is um, the preservation of existing housing units and their rehabilitation. And the way we're going to have a successful housing market in Massachusetts isn't merely by new construction. Uh, we need to have a, a constant uh, rehabilitation and upgrading of our existing housing stock to meet the needs of this generation. So I welcome, uh, you know, with Rob or, or Tom Gleason or so sure. forth, if there are things that we can do at the state policies that are making it um, uh, more difficult to uh, 
that it sort of favors ground up construction versus rehab and modernization of existing units. It's not our intention to be there. We're glad to hear about ways uh, to do that. We have actually made a conscious effort with our affordable housing dollars uh, to make sure that more of the money goes into rehab and preservation than was previously the case, because we agree with you that's critically, for Massachusetts, that's a critically important part of the puzzle. Given our housing stock, absolutely. Given our housing absolutely. stock, Absolutely. Right. Sir, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Yes. Uh, Roger Blood from Brookline. Thank you for having such a good conference. Um, I'd like to ask a question um, that the gentleman to my right asked at a prior panel, and uh, uh, moderator suggested that it might be even better directed towards uh, Secretary Bielecki. Um, the, um, the, the state's housing um, assistance funds have been um, somewhat frozen on the home ownership side for a couple of years now and are um, going mainly or entirely to the rental side. Um, we've, we've talked with uh, Secretary uh, Tina Brooks about this a uh, couple of times. She's terrific, by the way. Right. And um, it, she's indicated that we, you know, in Brookline or anywhere, we could have the best homeowner projects in the world for the last couple of years, and we think we, we have. And uh, the, the action is uh, strictly with rental as a matter of policy. Um, it, it's, uh, I think it's it, it indicated that it's not really a cutback of resources so much as a perception of risk. And I'm wondering if you might comment both on when the, uh, the freezing of the homeownership, uh, homeowner spigot might be uh, reversed. and and what your perception of the risk is at this point relative to rental. Yeah. So first of all, just so everyone knows, uh, Tina Brooks was our great undersecretary for nice. housing and community <laughs> development. And unfortunately, she left us for a great job in New York City uh, this summer, and we're, I'm still looking for her replacement. But Tina and I have talked about that, just so everybody may, may or may not know the background. Uh, there's a certain amount of state, both cash subsidy and uh, tax credits available to support the development of affordable housing, rehab and new construction of affordable housing in Massachusetts. Historically, uh, some of that money was dedicated to rental housing. Some of that money was dedicated to home ownership. Uh, we made the decision for the last two or three years now that uh, all of it was going uh, merely to rental. I think at the time we made that decision, um, it was mostly uh, sort of by necessity. In other words, if in literally in 2008, um, uh, it didn't matter how much subsidy we were going to put towards a home ownership situation, particularly a condo situation. A lot of it's multifamily and the condom, therefore condominium, and there just wasn't going to be any private financing to match us uh, and do home ownership uh, projects. Uh, and so it was just a question of um, if we put money into uh, rental projects, we could continue to make some progress, even if we offered to put some money for home ownership, we just weren't going to see it. Um, I think that's, um, that's, that's evolved a little bit, and, and it be, was started as a, more of a decision of necessity, and now it's more of a, a decision of choice, which is just that if you look in 2011, um, although there's still, there is now some renewed interest in home ownership opportunities, um, because the way our rental markets have recovered in Massachusetts, it's a big story in the Globe this weekend about that, um, there has been overwhelming demand for our rental round, uh, rental uh, housing assistance. And um, so we've just figured it's more of a deliberate choice just in supply and demand that we thought um, we literally got more than 100 applications for different pro rental projects this fall and uh, was an unprecedented amount of demand for that. So it was really just putting the resources where the demand was. But I think we did, Tina and I did talk about um, with this fall, whether this fall would have been the time to put some resources back toward home ownership. And ultimately we decided not quite yet, um, but we're uh, obviously that, that put it on our radar screen and we will be revisiting it as we go into 2012. And, I, you should continue to, you know, you, I assume, have contacts at our folks at DHCD and the, the team that's still there, great team that's still there, there working for Tina. And, um, but, you know, continue to give us your input about what, what the market is. It, it is not a decision made on high, uh, you know, in, in some kind of a principled uh, judgment. It's a very pragmatic decision about what kind of opportunities are available to us in rental versus home ownership and sort of where we're going to get the most bang for our buck in terms of state assistance. So it, it's not primarily risk driven at this point, aversion, aversion to condominium finance. Well, it's, I mean, again, um, it, it's, 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 it's not risk driven based on our 
our perception of risk. It's, 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 it's a practical judgment. If you can show us that for the projects you're looking at, the private banks are willing to accept the risk, then we're okay. You know, in other words, we're not, if, 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 on the other, if the private banks are showing that they're prepared to take on those risks and support those kind of projects, then I think we want to know about that and we can get comfortable with it too. Um, we're not, we, uh, our resources are very helpful in getting affordable housing projects done, um, but, but we don't, we can't single-handedly do, we, almost all the projects we're involved in also rely on private finance. So if the situation is with respect to the home ownership condominium side, that the private lenders, if they're not willing to accept the rest, the risk, we're not going to sort of up our subsidy to convince them to lower their risk or to take on a project they're not wanted. That's not a good use of the public taxpayer dollars. But if we're finding, if, and if you could find, and it may vary by market, that you're seeing that our private, those who used to be our private partners, are willing to invest in those kind of projects again and aren't asking us to take on the risk, um, then we want to know about that, and that will encourage us to um, start putting some more resources back towards home ownership. Great, just time for one more short question. Charles Ruck, Springfield Neighborhood Housing Services. The um, question was asked earlier in terms of what, on, what homeowners may deserve support and what form that support may take. I've got a couple of examples, one good and not one, the other not so good. Uh, the Secretary made reference to employer assistance programs, and we've got one going on in Springfield that's very successful where companies like Mass Mutual and Bay State uh, Health are making significant contributions. And if employ the employees buy in one of our targeted neighborhoods, uh, Mass Mutual will give $10,000, Bay State $7,500, uh, the two colleges, AIC and Springfield College, $5,000, and we'll match that through a grant uh, uh, from the Commonwealth. Uh, the Mass Mutual and uh, Bay State programs have really been up and running. On the two colleges, they've been slow, and so re Springfield College recently decided, it, it, its board voted, to up its assistance to 7,500 per employee who, who buys within the neighborhood. Uh, an example that's not so good that started out with a lot of fanfare is a federal program called the Emergency Homeowners Loan Program, which on the surface was a great program with a lot of uh, enthusiasm that was geared to help home, uh, homeowners who were in mortgage distress due to uh, an economic loss of income because of either the economy uh, or a medical emergency. However, in the administration of that program, uh, I, I, I believe that we've snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And let me give you an example. If a married couple living in the same house, with a husband and wife both working, but say one spouse's name is on the note, both names are on the deed, but only one name is on the note. And if it's the husband's name on the note and the wife loses her job involuntarily, they are ineligible for support in this program. And I think that uh, we're gonna find that the program by and large was, was very un uh, uh, undersubscribed. And so I encourage any conversation that, I mean, we've tried our agency, but any conversation as a post-mortem on the program in your discussions with HUD, that you bring up some of these common sense type barriers that were, that were raised. The other thing I want to bring up is I know that, that the state's revenues are above projections, and we talked about the state unemployment rate being very low, but that's not the way it's happening in Springfield. And so we need a different, more focused strategy there to make sure that the taxpayers there are benefiting to the same rate as the taxpayers and the rest of the Commonwealth. God bless you. Thank you. So I think many people share your view on the federal program, and that's the, uh, I, I think that's an example of what we're talking about. Uh, the most important thing we can do is, is create a better cycle of information where we're circling back the information that you all have uh, on the ground in your communities about what's working and not working and, 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 and get those changes. Uh, on the first point about the, uh, Employer assisted housing, it is a great model in Springfield. And that um, I could have mentioned if someone had pushed me on it that I think that's the one community in Massachusetts that has the most employer engagement in housing issues of that kind that I was saying we haven't seen enough of in Massachusetts. But 
in Springfield, as was mentioned, uh, you've got the big employers, uh, Mass Mutual, Bay State, uh, and the two colleges, uh, as really saying uh, it helps our business and our employees um, to have uh, a better housing market in Springfield. And that is actually that is uh, one of the initiatives we had back in 07. Um, started to pilot whether we could match uh, some of those investments made by those Springfield uh, employers um, when we had more money than we did. But that's, that would be the kind of initiative that we would like to partner with. And this is the future of film ownership, and that may be a model for others to hearken to. So final comments, short comments from, from both of you. Uh, Representative Golden? Thank you very much for inviting me here today. My pleasure. Very thank you for being here. Yourself? Yeah. The same. And thank, yeah. and, and thank you. I should also say, I want to also say to all of you that uh, um, it, it, separate and apart from the housing stuff, uh, the, the realtor community that's here, we thank you also. You provide another very important function as we're trying to make Massachusetts a better, more attractive state to do business. One of the things that we always get high marks on in the business climate survey is the quality of life in our communities that is perceived as, a, as businesses want to be here in part uh, because uh, for, their, for their management and for their employees up and down the line, they know this is a great place for uh, quality of life for their employees. And part of that's the school systems, but part of it is a lot of other aspects of the character of our communities. And we know that you play a tremendous civic role locally in helping uh, uh, preserve and promote that quality of life. And that's not only a good thing in itself, it is also actually one of Massachusetts' competitive advantages for business. So thank you. And speaking from Washington. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you.